Shalom, shalom, holy friends, near and far. We're so happy you're here with us today for this very exciting moment, this very exciting learning opportunity with Mindy Weisel, a very, a very interesting uh, person and renowned artist. Ellie Weisel's cousin, and she was born in Bergen-Belsen and has had an illustrious career uh, and impact since then. <laughs> and in partnership today with Temple Solo, we're going to hear today about how Heschel taught me to be an artist. <laughs> Mindy Weisel, an internationally renowned artist, author, and speaker, was elected into the Smithsonian Archive of American artists in 2000. Her works are in the permanent collections of the National Museum of American Art, Oxford University, and the Israel Museum, among many other public and private collections. Weisel is the author of Daughters of Absence, Transforming a Legacy of Loss and Touching Quiet Reflections in Solitude. She is also a member of the United States Art in Embassies Program at the US Department of State. Wiesel lived and worked for over 40 years in Washington, D.C., and now resides in Jerusalem with her husband. And we're going to look at this wonderful book here after The Obligation of Beauty, uh, which is not only uh, amazing for its ideas, but for its amazing art and pictures you'll see throughout the book. Um, and we'll have the chance to see some of those today as well. Mindy Wiesel, thank you so much for being here. You hear me? Can you hear me now? Great. So we thought it would be lovely if you started off, if you could actually read for us the first paragraph of your book. I think it would be a great uh, introduction to what we're what we're doing here today. Thank you, Rabbi. And thank you, Valley Beit Midrash, for inviting me. First of all, it's a great privilege and honor. And I'm looking forward to sharing this time with you and all the viewers in learning together. Um, I would like to read the opening uh, paragraph and it's called The Story I Can Tell. A long time ago, I stopped wishing for a different past, one where the mother and father were not Holocaust survivors. When I started writing this book over 10 years ago, perhaps I would have emphasized my parents' story more than my own. Yet I feel that the horrors of the Holocaust are not mine to tell. As much as I believe this tragic history must never, never be forgotten, I also know that I am not the one to write about them. I also know that I am not the one to speak of man's inhumanity to man. Yet I can speak of seeking a purpose in living an attempt at a fulfilling and meaningful life in the face of such enormous tragedy. I have been living a life in search of beauty. And that is the opening paragraph of the book. Amazing, yeah. amazing, Mindy, thank you so much for that. What a, what a great way to start here. You know, I also just wanna wish you a mazel tov, a, a very special mazel tov for being awarded a presidential medal from Germany the order of merit for, for your work of tikkun olam and uh given at the german ambassador's home in israel so mazel tov for that, that it uh, brings a light to us that's incredible i didn't even know such a thing existed and were it not for COVID, they would have sent me to berlin but i'm so happy it's here in israel and my father who is alive and well 96 Leah and Hara, in los angeles and still lectures at, on the holocaust with his number and everything at the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Now that it's closed, it's done Zoom. But when I asked him how he felt about my accepting this award, they made a very big deal about my accepting this award from Germany. He felt, he just said, Mindela, you weren't raised with hate. And that's, that was it. And my that's feeling is if you live long enough, <laughs> that was really my feeling. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. That's wonderful. So, you know, just to kick it off a little bit here together, can you tell us a little bit about about the title of this book? It's called After. Well, first of all, the book really did uh, take 10 years in writing. And I think in the writing of the book, I really wrote 10 different books. And 
it went through many titles. At one point it was making marks more an emphasis on being an artist. Other times the survival of beauty, the emphasis more on being a Holocaust survivor's daughter. Um, it just went through so many manifestations and I think I needed to be approaching my 75th birthday to finally understand what I wanted out of life. I also was raised with so much of before what happened before the war, what happened during the war, that I felt that the only chapter I, I could possibly write from my voice was after. So after, what is my after? And my mother emphasized very strongly, people always ask me, did your parents talk about the Holocaust? My mother didn't. My mother talked about what existed, her beautiful life in Hungary before the war. She wanted me to know the grandparents I never knew, her sisters were all killed in Auschwitz, her family, her all but three brothers survived. And my mother wanted me to know about the beautiful life and she insisted on it. She really insisted that I live it. And my father, on the other hand, nine out of 11 children in his family from Siget, and he's the cousin side of Elie Wiesel, survived the war. And he talked about it all the time. So there was this constant, life is beautiful, life is scary, life is beautiful, life is frightening, life is beautiful, how can you have faith? All this went into my makeup, and I feel in the writing of this book, so much of, of what I believe happened to my generation after, we're now all approaching our 70s, and, um, and my obligation it was going to be called the survival of beauty. And my younger daughter who lives here in Israel with her family suggested obligation. On that note, I'd like to read something beyond fascinating, three sentences that shocked me no end because I found, okay, I go to visit my father in LA just a couple weeks ago when we felt there was a window in traveling. I hadn't seen him in three years. We were going to go and then COVID and on and on. So as I'm leaving my father's home with my husband, my father hands me this paper from the LA Jewish Journal, the Jewish press. And it's about an Israeli artist. And listen to this, this that my father who owned a bakery and never understood what I was doing as a painter, wasn't raised to be a painter. My parents were hardworking Holocaust survivors who owned a bakery and worked 16 hours a day and slept on Shabbat. And my father went to shul and still opens the shul in the morning, he hands me this. This is what he gives me, the greatest gift he could give me. The quote is from Harav Cook, and it's Pinchas Aron notebook in Boisk that he wrote in 1903. Literature, painting, and sculpture all serve the purpose of giving form to concepts buried deep in the human spirit. For us, as long as even a single brushstroke remains hidden in the depths of a thinking and feeling soul and is not shaped and formed, there is an obligation upon those who create art to express it. Can you imagine getting this paragraph from Rav Cook from my father, 1903, when I read the word obligation and for me, when I use, when my daughter suggested, I just felt like that's it. And what is the obligation of beauty? The obligation of beauty is simply a recognition of how vital it is and how to start off with the reference to Heschel, the sense of wonder is what creates our spirit. And if we have this sense of wonder and then being in a studio where you're dealing constantly with the ineffable, things you just don't understand, I felt that the obligation of beauty is what we felt and needed to express after the Holocaust. Yeah, I love that. And by framing it as an obligation, we all, it's almost um, implying that for everyone it's not natural. We have to almost charge ourselves towards living in the phenomenal realm. You know, exactly. something about how your family uh, life is beautiful, life is tragic, life is beautiful, life is tragic. You know, I really believe more and more we have to live simultaneously holding the light and the dark. 
And I know people who want to just promote the light, happiness, optimism, and those who just want to promote the dark. Life is scary and broken and everything is corrupt. And, uh, and this ability to hold on to the light and dark. And so, and so I love that, that your work is doing that. Um, so let me ask you, I mean, I know we're going to after, but let's go to before for a moment. When did you realize you wanted to be an artist? Uh, there's a chapter in the book called My Father's Drawing. And as a young girl, I, I think I was about 12 or 14. I don't really remember exactly, but my parents didn't bring much with them, obviously, from the displaced persons camp. My parents both survived Auschwitz. They both um, found each other alive in Bergen-Belsen. They were one of the first weddings in January 46, and I was one of the, among the first children January 47. And they brought with them, we lived in Bergen-Belsen for three years. And when we came to America, my father brought a little black suitcase. And this black suitcase, I loved the smell of it. I loved everything about it, even as a little girl. And then one day I opened it when I was a teenager. And there was this black notebook of Yiddish writings and poems and songs. And a drawing fell out. And the chapter in the book will go into more detail. And there'll be a picture of the drawing. But I, I had, it was kind of a perfect storm. I had a teacher in junior high school, Mrs. Rose, who said, you should really be an artist. And in my thinking, an artist, I had parents who were standing 16 hours a day working so hard. And artists sound like such a romantic vision to me. Little did I know how hard it really was. But um, it was like a, a storm of somebody saying, you know, you, you should think about doing this and then seeing my father's drawing and feeling something and recognizing that a mark can make you feel something. And it was just like this bulb going on in my head. And then when I got to university, I started majoring in painting and art history. And that's what I've been doing for 50 years. Amazing. So you already started talking about Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Can you talk a little bit more about um, what influence he had on you becoming an artist and, and what you find so compelling. Uh, in, yeah. in thought, yeah. Yes, I actually, you know, I'm not a scholar, so I hope nobody expects a scholarly approach to Heschel, but I can tell you that in reading, in my life as a reader, and you know, when you're, I was the only daughter and only child for six years, and I have a younger brother who lives in California and with his family, but the parents weren't present. Even when they were present, they weren't present. They were damaged. They experienced loss. They tried. You, you didn't pay attention to your own life. And what I, before I go into the Heschel thing, I just would like to mention that the book is not a Holocaust book. As I mentioned in the opening paragraph, it's a book of how did I find, how did I find meaning and fulfillment? And I think I can really say with all my heart that Heschel helped me from the beginning because, and I'll, I'd like to read a couple quotes from him that I have underlined and gone to many times over my life. In 1979, I actually became obsessed. I had my first real studio in downtown Washington, DC, and I became obsessed with my father's number. And I did over a hundred paintings with my father's number. And I would do these beautiful paintings and then the need to not let, let it live. I would blacken them out and then light would survive. I realized that during this period, 1979 to 1980, I was really searching and I started reading Heschel. And my big question then is how does one have faith after the Holocaust. Now I was raised in a very Hasidic environment in Brooklyn. My parents were modern Orthodox. My father was the baby in the family and we moved to LA. So it was a modern Orthodox young Israel kind of community, but my immediate family were all Hasidim. And I couldn't really relate to that life. And I was looking for meaning in my own life. And Heschel, I opened, this was the first thing I ever read in Heschel. It's in his book, I Ask for Wonder. Um, and this is the quote that when I realized I need to read Heschel. The great problem in the life of man is whether to trust and to have faith in God. The great problem in the life of God is whether to trust and to have faith in man. Not to prove that God is alive, 
but to prove that man is not dead, not to prove him, but to prove ourselves. And I, I, since that quote, and I think I was like 30 years old at the time and working on this series, which by the way, ended up, I was all with 30 and ended up with an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in New York and it, uh, being written all over. And it opened my eyes to the reality that as long as I paint what I need to, what I feel I have to, it will stay honest and authentic and I will be, I, it, it's my voice. But to think about doing Holocaust paintings then, there was no Schindler's List, no museums. There wasn't the literature there is today. But so I started reading Heschel. And then after that very quote, the next quote that I underlined and have like on my studio wall, it's called Something Asked. And it's in Heschel's, uh, these are all quotes. The Book of Wonder, actually, this quote is from God in Search of Man. I have the whole library. But I love this quote because this is how it affected me as an artist. So first I'm dealing with how can I have faith after the Holocaust? Then I'm going to the beginning of faith. So the beginning of faith is not a feeling for the mystery of living or a sense of awe, wonder, and amazement, which I was constantly aware of, um, Rabbi Shmuley. I was always aware of this sense of awe and amazement. But Heschel says the root of religion is the question what to do with the feeling uh, for the mystery of living, what to do with awe, wonder, and amazement. And I realized that what I wanted to do and what felt right for me is to paint. And to me, when I started to paint and I was alone in my studio, I really recognized that this is where I have something to say. This is where I have something to say. And Heschel also believes in several things that when I, I ended up teaching, I was at the faculty of George Washington University for 10 years and taught painting. And whether you were Jewish or not Jewish, it didn't matter, you had to read Heschel, it was required reading. Because he really understood the artistic and creative temperament. For example, he'd say things like, an artist should not have a memory. What does that mean, an artist should not have a memory? And it's basically how he believes we should live our life in the present, in the moment. And I would tell my students, if you're busy thinking how you did this painting yesterday and how you were feeling yesterday, this painting isn't gonna feel very much about what you're feeling today. So each painting that I approach, I approach very much in the moment and soon in our discussion, I'll be showing how I actually start a canvas by writing all over. I start by writing. And Heschel really understood that, that you had to get to a place of the ineffable to make art, which means something that you don't realize where it's coming from, it's out of your control, it can't be expressed in words. The ineffable is something that cannot be expressed, it's beyond language. And there, and another thing that Heschel said that I loved, and I, I really use all the time in my own little way of getting myself to the studio, in Heschel's thoughts on prayer, he would say, if you never pray, and it doesn't have to be in a synagogue, a temple, if you never pray, you don't have the possibility of feeling prayer. And I, I really use that as an analogy to go to the studio. When somebody says, I don't feel like going to the studio. Well, if I waited till I felt like going to the studio, I probably would have made three paintings. It's never easy to go to the studio. You have to be alone. You have to feel. If you don't feel, the viewer can't feel anything. So you have to be alone. You have to be in the studio. In fact, when students would ask me, do they have talent? I would say the bigger question is, can you accept the responsibility of being a painter, of being an artist, of making art? It requires you to be present and in awe. You know, I think of Heschel's famous quote that everyone has heard, uh, um, that when in, in, in marching for civil rights, he felt he was praying with his feet. Um, and I feel like for you, you, pay, you, you almost pray with your... <laughs> 
I do. I love that. Nobody's ever said that to me. I love it. I, I just love it. Solitude, uh, you know, the need to go to that difficult place of solitude, of emotional outpouring, of focus. It's so. So let me ask you. You know, in in Heschel's phenomenology of radical amazement, right? You know, I, I think he's really looking at um, the beautiful through the prism of the world that is rather than the world that could be. Now, of course, he is dreamer. He is fascinated with the prophets and is, a, is, a, is an activist. But I think in his phenomenology of radical amazement, he wants us to, like you said, be in the present, not in the past and not in the future. And I wonder, when you talk about the obligation of beauty, how much of that for you is like Heschel to see beauty in what already is versus is an obligation to create a, a beauty that does not yet exist? That's an excellent question. That is a really genuinely interesting question. I think, I think that it's really a two-part question. Number one, First of all, I, let's, let's start with this. I, my children know I don't like the word happy, okay? I never heard ha Heschel use the word happy. He's the one who really taught me the word is more fulfillment. Do you feel fulfillment? Who's happy? I mean, who's happy every day? If, who can be happy every minute with what's going on in the world? And, and you know, you hope that you have golden moments, you have happy moments on a personal level, on a family level, on a community level. There's a simcha life. You know, my Hasidish cousins really understand dance and song and Shabbat. And, you know, I love it. It's very inspiring. But Heschel uses the word fulfillment. And I think in order to be fulfilled, you have to live in a certain state of gratitude and which comes in with Modaani every morning and a certain state of radical amazement. If you walk by today, for example, I was reading Heschel this afternoon, really just to kind of refresh some of his thoughts. I feel he's so deep in me, but do I have the language? And I'm looking out at the, um, at the sky and it looked as if the clouds were right. And here I am in Yushalayim in Jerusalem. And it looked like the sky was writing in Hebrew. And I wrote a friend of mine who lives here in Israel. I said, I think Hashem is giving us a Hanukkah message. And so we ended up talking about that. That's radical amazement. You know, not just to look at the sky and see the clouds. And I don't walk by anything without seeing it. It's a curse and it's a gift you know, because you have to feel everything, you smell everything, you see everything, you feel everything. You know, I'm constantly announcing I have the chills. You know, some people, by the way, this is interesting um, current phenomena. I've noticed that women my age have no trouble welling up. You know, though somebody will be moved by something in tears. I do not cry. I don't well up, I don't cry. You're a Holocaust survivor's daughter, you're not allowed to cry. From childhood, what are you crying about? You have shoes, you have a bed, you're not hungry. Why are you crying? So the bar for living starts very high altogether as a child in my generation, I have found. And I think also, um, now I lost my thought. Oh, oh no, about feeling everything. So recently I had a physical and I mentioned to the doctor, I said, you know, I'm always announcing that I have the chills. And my husband says, why do you always have to announce it? And I say, because it surprises me. I was like, oh my God, I just got the chills. It surprises me. So I asked the doctor if there was a scientific explanation. And she said, yes, it means that your emotions are very close to the surface, but you weren't allowed to express them. So I've had the chills since I'm a kid. So there's some things that never, ever go away, not being able to cry, not, you know. But anyway, with Heschel's radical amazement, I think that that is the present. He also talks about man's responsibility of creating a better world, of tikkun olam, of look at what he did, Rabbi Shmuley. He, he as you say, when he died in, in 1972, when he died at his deathbed, they found a book on Vietnam, a safer, 
you know, this was the variety of his reading and thinking and commitment. And I think that that's why I feel the question is, is two answers. One, in the present, you live with radical amazement if you are open to it. And Heschel has tried to open our minds and our souls to just that. And then what is our responsibility to God? What does God want of us? We're so busy, is God alive here, not there, you know? What does he want of us? What do we owe, the obligation we owe to the beauty God created? Beautiful, beautiful, so powerful, thank you. So now let's turn to your book. We're gonna look at some of the images and hear some of your explanations of some of this artwork, this beautiful okay. in your book here. Okay, the first image should be, um, it's gonna look like it's a million scribbles. So let's look at that and we'll talk about that. Okay, a pinch out for a bigger view. What does that mean? I'm not sure what that means, but um, that canvas is actually what a painting of mine looks like before I start to paint. And it's not scribbling, it's writing and writing and writing. And I turn it upside down and continue writing. I turn it sideways and continue writing. And I write, I, I, I have no choice. I write till there is not a word left in me and I have to paint. It's almost a clearing away of the weeds, of the thinking, of the whatever it is, I need to get to what's real inside me. And this seems to be my process. Now this painting, the next painting, God's Tears, um, that is the painting. The underneath of that painting is this painting. It was done in Yushalayim. It's in the permanent collection of the Israel Museum. And I literally cried layer upon layer upon layer of working. We had just made Aliyah and it was raining. We had made Aliyah in September and of course, always during Sukkot it rains, right? So it was Cholamo Sukkot. I was in my studio and it rained and it rained. And it deals with I can't really say what a painting deals with. I can tell you what it felt like to me. I was working in layers of color and the color would not stay put. It became blue, which is a color, which I talk about in my book, which always relates to my mother. All my work has blue. The cover of my book is blue. Um, in the book, you'll read about Lily in blue, what I did in, in art related when my mother died. And this painting, seemed to have 40 years of work in it. Work that had gone from dark to light and there's layers of light coming through. Um, if you look from the top to the bottom in every horizontal band of the painting, there is light coming through. And that to me, that to me is radical amazement. Like how did the light survive all these layers of painting? And this is an oil on canvas and it's about seven feet high and five feet wide. So it's huge. And the next one, Pam, the next painting. Now that painting is where I'm letting the writing go show and you can read it in the book, um, but I'll tell you what prompted it. My father who never complains, never wants me to trouble myself with anything, um, I got a call that he was in the hospital and he didn't want me to come, but I insisted on going. And I get there in the morning, my father's in the hospital, you have to visualize this. It's six o'clock in the morning and my father is lying on his back. He does not know I'm there. He's hooked up to things and he's saying shachris by heart without his tefillin. And I'm a meditator. I meditate every morning after my modani. And so I decide I'm not gonna disturb my father from his davening, even though he's in a hospital bed and doesn't know I'm there, the room is dark. I sit in a chair and I write about this experience when I got back to this studio. And all I could muster up the energy for after this trip was this blue rose. And this is like Min HaShemayim. Mm. Who, who can paint this? I mean, who did this? I, I have nothing to do with this. I, the writing maybe because I experienced it, but the blue rose, which was really 
in, in my language, missing my mother. And in the book, there's a picture of my mother standing very straight in her blue dress. And you see this painting and you realize that's what it was. Um, next, so it can go from very complicated layer, layer, layer to a breath. Then it can go to talk about being in the present and being in the moment. I make Aliyah, these were all done in my uh, Jerusalem studio. I started listening to Israeli music and Rami Kleinstein, the Israeli singer has a song called La Netzach, which in English is the song Forever Young. Bob Dylan song Forever Young, but hearing it in Hebrew. And here you see some of the writing showing, I go back and I write and I paint and, and I didn't realize what I was doing till I was finished. And my, my, um, one of my children looked at this and said, is this the Israeli flag? And I didn't even realize the imagery of the blue and white as being emblemic of the Israeli flag. So it's all very unconscious. I do not uh, have any idea what I'm going to paint. I have no concept, no idea. I write, as I said, till I paint and then I paint. If I need to cry, I'll put on sad music. If I need to dance, I'll put on joyful music. The painting is always a life of its own. The next one is the last one I'm showing here. And this one is called um, The Song of Blue. And this was after making Aliyah and I was working with materials and I just love the abstraction of it. I, had, I have no idea what it means. I have no idea except that I just loved it. I felt like this is what it feels like when you feel the Shrina, when you feel a spiritual presence near you. Because I, it, it was very magical to me, this painting. I thought it was gonna end up very dark and the blue insisted on surviving the painting process. So each work, as you can tell, is a living through it. And then when you're done, when I feel, people always ask me, how do you know you're done? And I know I'm done when I sit in front of it and long enough and I don't feel like making another mark. I have nothing else to say. Whatever I have to say has been said. It's on to the next. 40 years of it, on to the next. Wow, amazing, amazing. Okay, friends, we're gonna open up the opportunity for others to ask some questions here. Certainly I have more, but we want to open this up. So feel free to unmute yourself and we would love to hear from you. Yeah, I just wanted to say, this is not a question, but I really appreciate you, the way you've shared um, all of this with us. It's very Thank inspiring. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, it, it's very uh, beautiful the way you um, give the backstory behind all of your paintings. And I'm wondering um, for people who view your paintings in a book or in a museum, do they also get the backstory? And is it, do you do, a, do, do, you do an audio on it like you're doing now? No, you know, I actually, that's an excellent question because it is abstract. And my father listened to this day, <laughs> to this day is looking for an apple to recognize in the work, you know? No, I don't do an audio, but I can tell you um, attending my own openings, art openings and exhibits with hundreds of people there throughout time, uh, throughout the 40 odd years that I've been painting, the critics, the people, the letters I get, I think when you look at my work live or you live with the work or whatever, you feel something, you feel it. And 
I'm always, I love hearing what other people feel. I know what I felt. And it's always a great, oh my God, they felt that too moment, even now. Um, I think my work is work that is felt, not something that needs to be understood. It's like, I know very little about music, but I know how I feel when I'm listening to music. And I think that's the relationship my art has to the viewer. You want to live with it. You want to look. There's layers. You find things. I, I'm still finding things in paintings that I live with. I don't think you need an audio. But the book is interesting because there's a chapter called My Mother's Back about a painting that gave me a lot of trouble after a fire my mother was in. The book talks about where painting comes from, how it relates to my personal history, where I have found meaning. There's poems in the book. There's also journals. It's a memoir, so it's as honest as I possibly could have it be. That's a great question. If, if I can do a follow-up. Sure. You talk about um, your art almost as an interactive experience between you and the viewer. Um, and it would be interesting to somehow um, capture um, that interaction in terms of people's reaction, some way of them actually participating, if you will, in the experience of your painting. Well, uh, that's a good question. If you go to my website, if you go to mindywiesel.com, it there's a, a section called interviews. I have spoken publicly since 1978, I think, and it always is a very participatory questions and answers. My art doesn't seem to stop in the studio or in the gallery or in people's homes. I've spoken on behalf of God knows what, you know, uh, um, to senior citizens, to us, art students, to museums, in museums, homeless women's shelters. I mean, I've spoken wherever I'm invited to speak, I'm happy to speak. Wherever anybody wants to discuss my art or life, I'm happy to do that. My last speaking was very meaningful. In January, 2020, it was the 75th anniversary, 75th International Holocaust Remembrance Day in England celebrated at Oxford University. And the British had liberated Bergen-Belsen and I was invited to speak at Oxford. And um, if I may, I'd like to read a, the, I didn't wanna do the whole talk at Oxford, but I have an excerpt which ties into the book and my feelings about life and having gotten this current incredible presidential award from Germany. I mean, it's all so strange, you know, but um, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think it is interesting having the viewer participate in the viewing and I like to do it and I do it a lot. And, um, but this is what I spoke, this is the last paragraph or one of the paragraphs, I don't remember that I spoke at Oxford. Um, and it's basically the theme of the book also. My belief in moving forward with love is unshakable. Despite all the atrocities committed by the Nazis, atrocities that impacted my life profoundly, I simply do not believe in hate. And, you know, I think on that note, I think that my art is an act of love. It always feels like an act of love to, to me. As much as I was raised with a great sadness, I believe the only antidote to hate is in, in expressing love for mankind. I believe in kindness and in creating beauty. We must not stand by passively nor allow hatred to undermine the love we need if we are to live in a civilized world. We must, of course, resist those people who believe that our differences give them license to lash out. We must not forget the essential message now as always. Only love and a passionate move towards action for the good can enrich our world. And that ties in, having delivered this at, at Oxford, you know, I obviously didn't have the opportunity to go into Heschel, but on this talk, 
I do believe that reading Heschel in my life, reading as much as I have and care about what he has to say, he was a living example, as Rabbi Shmuley said, of walking, you know, you vote with your feet, you put your feet where you believe. If you can move towards action, and you know, the sadness I feel, and I write here that as much as I was raised with a great sadness, this is a defenseless sadness that is a permanent stain on my heart. This will never go away. And all I can do for my living as a survivor's child is to try to create beauty in the face of it. Because what else can I do? On that note, hold on, there's a great quote. Oh, let me see, I hope I, I have it here. Heschel quoted a great Hasidic um about mourning hold on yes um this is great this is so great um heschel often quoted a hasidic teaching there are three ascending levels of how one mourns with tears that is the lowest with silence that is higher and with a song that is the highest. So my song is painting, oh. which is interesting actually, because when I teach and when I paint, there's usually a mark. I tell my students, they say, well, am I finished? And I say, well, look at your painting. Do you feel that you've made the mark that makes the painting sing? There's usually a mark right at the end that comes like directly from the neshama, from your mm -hmm. heart that, wow. And then your song, your painting, your song, your dance, your music, whatever it is. But Heschel felt that the arts had the ability, not tears, not silence. In other words, don't grieve your whole life. You can't do that. You can't sit and be a monk your whole life and sit in silence. And you have to move and you have to sing, which I think is probably the core of Hasidism. And Heschel was so brilliant because he crossed all the worlds and took religion into a completely other sphere. So Mindy, picking up on this powerful point, um, I wanna talk about injustice a little bit. You know, I believe that humans have a need to respond to injustice. I, 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 and, I, and I don't mean that as a moral point, I mean as a psychological point. We will suffer if we don't respond to suffering. and there's various ways to respond to that. And as someone who doesn't have a single artistic bone in my body, literally <laughs> my four-year-old daughter- Don't has, say that. No, no, my four-year-old daughter makes me draw a unicorn and she cries when I draw a unicorn for her because it, it looks like a monkey, it looks like a rock. It's not a unicorn. And she goes, yeah. So I don't have an artistic bone in my body, but, but, you know, but I do feel the need when I see injustice to try to respond to it. And I feel that art can be a different form of expression, a need to respond to brokenness. And I wonder though, for you, in what way does the art become the end? As a, uh, you know, and in what way is, is, does art kind of stimulate um, other, ne other needs to respond? So let me ask that one slightly different way. I, d d is art ever a distraction from concretely respond to injustice? Or is it, is it an enhancement in your sense uh, uh, in terms of what we can do in the activist realm? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, and it's, a, it's something that I've never been asked. I actually have to think about it for a minute on a conscious level, but I take issue with something you said because you're saying artistic in drawing. To me, creativity is mm. what Heschel is talking about. People can bake a challah, can put flowers in a vase, can give a drusha, can put together a Shabbat talk, can set a Shabbat table, can walk in a posture that is pure holiness. Creativity is not putting the mark on paper. That's the only thing I know how to do. I flunked math, I flunked science, I flunked anything now. Does that mean a doctor's not creative? You know, is a doc everybody has their creativity. Okay, you can't do a unicorn. I feel sorry for you, I can't either. <laughs> but, but, um, your daughter will know how, but um, 
I don't know about this issue of injustice. I don't know. I don't believe in an eye for an eye, I guess. I don't, I, you know, Rabbi Shmuley, it's such an interesting question because in reality, for my 60th birthday, my husband said, we can go anywhere. And I talk about this in the book and I end up going to Berlin and I write about what it felt like going to Germany. And then in 2009, I am welcomed by the mayor of Dachau and taken to Dachau. And all of this I write about in the book. And I ask myself, why don't I feel anger? I don't know, maybe I do. Maybe my paintings start out with so much writing and I get the anger. I don't know. I, I don't experience anger that way. I Well, first of all, to the public who's listening, in reality, um, psychiatrists have now, there's a clinical study out of Mount Sinai, especially in New York on Holocaust survivors' children. There's so much been written, starting with Helen Epstein's Children of the Holocaust in 1979. But um, it seems to me that there's a somewhat of a generalization. I'm sure there are people who fall in between the cracks, but either you absorb the sadness in the home or you absorb the anger. I seem to have absorbed the sadness. So I have spent a life, you know, feeling days where I'm really pretty sad. I'm not angry, I'm sad. And I, I had a mother who expressed anger. I had a father who expressed anger. But for me, maybe anger was too dangerous. So I don't think of art or anything as... Now, that's such an interesting question. You'll have to invite me back so we can talk about that. Because can you deal with injustice through art. That is a very interesting topic for another time, really. It has me thinking. Now I have to go read more. Yeah. Great. Amazing. Anyone else want to jump what in? What do you think? What do you uh, think? Oh, uh, well, I, 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 my, my first answer is I have no idea. My second answer is that I most certainly do believe you can address, address injustice through art um, and that artists are a crucial part of movement building and justice work. Um, but, what, but what I could say on, on the personal level is that I have been skeptical of any kind of artistic uh, expression for myself because I've been worried it would fulfill my need to respond. There's times where I, I, oh, I, I watch the news or I, I read something, I say, this is horrible. I just wanna write. I just wanna read it more. I just wanna think about it. I wanna meditate on it. And then I say, no, I gotta go beyond my room. I gotta go out there. I gotta go out there because if I express it here, I might fulfill the need to respond. Exactly, exactly. So that what you're saying now to others, their need to write might be exactly where it ends and they write books, sod more books. You have a need to be very active with your, you know, I do want to say one thing that I didn't say, which I think has helped a great deal in my life. I have asked every rabbi, Every, every priest, every, every professor, every poet, everyone I have ever really come into contact with that I was interested in what they would have to say, how, how did they explain the Holocaust? And I think it was Rabbi Byron Sherman at Spurtis, I think it was, um, but he gave me a great answer. He said, God gave man free will. And when the Holocaust happened, God mourned, evil one. So, and Heschel talks about that, that if we focus on the evil, evil will win and God will mourn. We owe it to God to do good. We owe it to our own life to deal, perhaps that is the answer, to deal with injustice, whichever way we could look. Mm -hmm. uh, Rabbi Heschel, did march with Martin Luther King. I mean, how amazing is that when you think of what's going on in the world now? Yeah, wow. And the anti-Semitism that is being raised now and the, the hatred, it, it's yeah. just horrific, horrific. Yeah, thank you so much. Anyone else wanna jump in here? Well, just a, just a closing thought as we conclude here, and then you'll share any last stuff you want to share. I, 
I don't know that we'll ever li live in a world without hate or without injustice. Um, I, I, I don't believe we will. Um, but, I, but I do think that if, if the day came as such that our work wouldn't be done because there'd still be a lot more beauty to add. The work of people exactly. is not only repairing the broken, it's also new layers of beauty that are added upon, upon that. It's just like the word shalom, the word peace does in the absence of conflict. It means exactly. a, a harmony and a healing that goes beyond the absence of conflict. And so the work of beauty uh, transcends um, that, 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 that brokenness. So please, Mandy, if you want to offer us any, any final uh, words of bracha or, or uh, reflection. Well, I, I think what you said is so important. In our lifetime, I don't think any of us, till our work is done, our work is not done. And I think we each have to know, I think a very good example of, in reference to what you're embarking on, I have a friend, my husband, for example, he and his grandfather always did taharas for on men who had died. And I have a friend who does taharas on women. And one day I said, Ginger, do you think I should do a tahara? with you. And she said, no, that's not your mitzvah. And I think we all have to know what our mitzvah is. My mitzvah seems to be, because I don't seem to be doing anything else, is raising a family. I love flowers. I, I, I live to, I know that I'm in trouble. Let me just so that I don't paint a rosy picture to everything exactly what you said. There will be hate, there will be conflict. I have a Friday you know, once or twice a year, where I'll say to my husband, please don't bring me flowers for Shabbat. I'm so tired and I'm so low and flowers are a serious thing for me. I cut the stems, have to put them in water, have to change the water a day later. I cut them down till they're just buds. I won't throw them out till every last bud has had its life. So I, yes, you, you, some days I can't have flowers and some days I want bouquets of flowers. So it's, uh, I don't know if you can see this behind me. Let me see if you can, can you see that? I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can see it, but the house is full of flowers. The apartment is full of flowers. I came back to Shalayim out of being away for six weeks and all I want is flowers. So everyone enjoy the day Enjoy the day, enjoy the beautiful weather in Phoenix. <laughs> and Chag Sameach, Hanukkah Sameach to everyone. And Rabbi Shmuley, thank you so much. And I look forward to, to hearing you and seeing you now on your, on your YouTubes. Thank you so much. And I, 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 I cried at that story you shared of uh, walking in on your father davening Shacharit in the hospital. Uh, and uh, you're giving him that space and just experiencing it in full. And, uh, thank you for this beautiful art, this powerful presentation, and the bearing of your soul and your personal stories. Friends, I do hope you'll pick up this delightful book, um, After the Obligation of Beauty, and enjoy this as well. And wishing you so much bracha and fuah and, and hatzlacha. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Rabbi Shmuley. Be well. All the best.